a warm welcome from my side. Welcome to the Austrian Foreign Ministry. Welcome to our Tech Diplomacy Fireside Chat with Thomas Lohninger, who I'm going to introduce to you in a minute. Let me just uh, say a couple of introductory words, why we're doing these Tech Diplomacy Talks, Tech Diplomacy Fireside Chats. Well, Tech Diplomacy uh, has become a new priority for the Austrian Foreign Ministry. The reason being, as you're all aware, technology have become has become a defining factor for geopolitics and international relations. And we are concerned with how technology impacts international relations, in particular international law, human rights, uh, uh, is a very important part of our uh, of our work. Um, and as you all know, there are lots and lots of processes underway in terms of how to govern all these digital technologies, but also others, uh, other technologies like AI, quantum immersive technologies and like. So one of the reasons we're doing this is to build capacity in the Austrian Foreign Ministry to better understand how these technologies impact international relations, but also as a tool to do outreach to you, but also to forge new partnerships because we are strong believer in multi-stakeholder partnerships in strong involvement of civil society. That's why I'm very happy that we have Thomas Lohninger with us. So Thomas Lohninger is the executive director of the Austrian digital rights NGO, Epicenter Works. He's also vice president of the European um, uh, Association, uh, European Digital Rights, EDRI, and just recently been nominated by the UN Tech Envoy as co-chair of the working group on governance and member of the steering committee of the DPI Safeguards Initiative. And we're gonna talk about this in a minute. So the way we deal with this talk or FISA chat today is that Thomas will now get the floor and he will introduce to us what is the whole story about digital public infrastructure. We will then discuss uh, some recent developments on the European Union level and then Thomas will introduce us to the UN DPI Safeguards Initiative that was launched uh, last year at the General Assembly in September. Um, and this process is particularly important because, as you know, you might not know, we are soon starting uh, intergovernmental negotiations on the Global Digital Compact and the Pact for the Future, which contains a chapter on STI and science, technology and innovation and digitalization. At the same time, we're discussing all kinds of AI governance initiatives. So lots and lots of work to do. And without further ado, welcome Thomas Lohninger. Very happy to have you here. Thanks for coming and being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Claudia. And um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here, Excellencies, Sirs and Madams. Um, I, I really hope that we can have a brilliant discussion about a novel subject in Europe, I think, but one that might be at the top of the agenda for this year and the coming years. And we have a little bit of a presentation plan, that's why I have my laptop here, but I'm very much looking forward to the conversation that we'll have afterwards. And I hope that by now, all the people in the stream should be able to see the slides, which should also be here behind me. Um, and what I will do in the next 30 minutes or so is just give a brief overview from a European perspective. I'm coming at this issue as someone who has worked for civil society quite intensely on the European legislation that encompasses and regulates the building blocks of what we call digital public infrastructure. And while this term, digital public infrastructure, or DPI, is quite novel to the European debate, we actually have been working on this for many years in its components. Um, but let's just start with why and what. So why do these systems exist and what are they aiming to do? Um, the global perspective, and this is by no means a complete map, shows you that we have India in the lead here with the Atar system, which is also something that we'll talk about, because it's by far the biggest system with over a billion people on it. And in many global majority countries, we can actually see these systems being rolled out as we speak. There's a lot of debate, also high court jurisprudence by now to many of these systems. In Europe, uh, previously we only had national systems with a European framework for uh, bilateral acknowledgement, but not really one harmonized system. This is about to change. In the US, a similar picture, uh, we have many state level initiatives, 
uh, but in the absence of federal legislations, we see players like Apple or Google um, creating realities by establishing standards and putting it on the smartphones of millions of people. Um, and one important thing to know about the terminology is that although infrastructure is part of this phrase, we are not talking about telecommunications infrastructure. We are not talking about connecting the unconnected or meaningful connectivity, which are both extremely important debates. I've been working on neutrality oh. and telecom regulation for over a decade. I would love to talk about that, but not today. And it's also public infrastructure. So the idea is that this is created by governments, not by private actors. Mind you that in many jurisdictions, actually, there are public-private partnerships around these systems. And they all have in common these days that they are open up for the private sector. So very much thinking about economical benefits as well. And um, when we look at the SDGs, there's one primary one, 16.9, uh, that this whole thing tries to incorporate the uh, availability of universal legal identity online and offline. But mind you that, particularly if you talk with the UN Tech Envoy, there are many other SDGs that they see connected to this. May it be education or access to food, uh, democratic participation and so forth. Um, I promise you that we'll talk about ATAR because it is, uh, in a way, a look into the future. ATAR started quite early, over a decade ago, um, and it almost had a billion users before there was a real legal basis for it. Um, so only in 2015-16 uh, did we see uh, an actual establishment of legislation. There was also jurisprudence from the Indian Constitutional Court that found that without proper privacy safeguards, it would be uh, acceptable to, to have these systems rolled out. And in many cases also there is uh, interlocking between the local, for example, food programs with the ATAR system. So there's a federal infrastructure and a lot of bills on top of it. And how does ATAR and many of the um, digital identity systems work these days? Uh, it's very often bio biometrical identification. So the picture you see here of a little child getting her uh, iris scanned is actually official material from the Indian government. And to the right, you also see the official Twitter account, uh, X account from the Atar authority that particularly uh, advertises for children being uh, signed on to the Atar system. And they're also going to schools and there's also an interlocking with um, um, the right of democratic participation with these systems. Um, and Basically, on the technical level, we have um, the iris capture, as you've just seen, a photograph, and all 10 fingerprints that are scanned and basically create a human in the databases of the Indian government. And uh, there is also an ATAR number that's then given out. That is one uh, um, sequential number for every person that exists in the ATAR system. And this number in the original version of ATAR is then also used by all types of public or private services. Mind you, there have been improvements here. You can create pseudonymous numbers for particular use cases, but the biometrical identification is still the precondition for systems like in India or in Kenya. The system of digital public infrastructure contains four basic levels. Uh, the first and fundamental layer is digital identity. Without knowing in a database uh, who belongs to any particular state, it would be impossible to achieve all the other um, layers. And uh, there is, of course, a big debate that uh, interlocks with statelessness um, and with exclusion of particular parts of society. Uh, because, for example, the biometrical system couldn't acknowledge someone who, because of hard manual labor over years, doesn't have all 10 fingerprints. And not every human has uh, eyes and therefore couldn't get their eyes scanned. Um, and then, of course, there were also cases um, like in Uganda where um, uh, individual minorities were also excluded from these systems, um, for example, because they had a Muslim speaking name. Um, generally speaking, this uh, digital identity system is also encompassing uh, juristical persons, so companies. Um, and once that is achieved, we have the payments level, which is uh, the ability to send payments virtually. Um, and you can actually see a lot of that in, in some of European countries as well, 
Um, if you go to China, then you'll see even people on the street begging with QR codes to give them money. Ich freue mich sehr, dass wir nun zwei Irgendjemand ist, uh, okay. And we are coming to the Q&A soon, I promise. <laughs> um, yeah, payments. I, I, I think you know what payments are. Um, and then data exchange, um, which basically means that you, the, the DPI wants to enable companies and also public entities to obtain data about a person. Um, you can also see it with the once only system that we have discussed at length here in Europe. And then lastly, a consent uh, layer. And if we are, my slides, looking at the European uh, uh, perspective, we actually have corresponding legislation. The EDAS regulation is establishing a universally harmonized uh, system for identifying natural and legal persons. We're going to talk a lot about that in the next minutes. Digital Euro is a digital currency that we are establishing in Europe. Um, and uh, the, the negotiations are not where they should be, but there's still a plan to adopt this before the election, at least in first reading. We have the once only system in Europe that is already being implemented. So you no longer have to add your data to every municipality. Uh, if the government has it once, it will give it to others. And then with consent, of course, we have GDPR in Europe. Um, mind you that the uh, consent networks are going beyond the GDPR. And you can also see in EIDAS that many of the other layers are actually touched upon by this regulation. Many of the same goods apply to them. Um, and let's talk a little bit more about EIDAS and what this brings, because that's really the European perspective and the answer to many of these questions that I think people should be aware when entering into a UN level event. Um, so the uh, EIDAS regulation that's currently being performed mm -hmm. and is scheduled to be voted on this Thursday in the plenary and second reading um, is establishing something called the European Digital Identity Wallet. That's an app on your smartphone that you as a holder, as a person, should have for a variety of attributes. It will contain your national ID, but also your driver license, your diploma from university, uh, insurances that you might have, royalty programs from companies where you're a customer and many other things. It's actually an open system. So any type of attribute could be in there. And it's also open on the other side with its full function to authenticate, identify, verify attributes about a person and legally sign documents it can do all these things uh, for a uh, variety of stakeholders. This could be the internet, it could be um, banks or any other company that has a requirement to identify the customers, but it could also be uh, insurances, hospitals, uh, the police, any border crossing point or port of entry and so forth. And to put it in a sentence, what we have here is a universal general purpose infrastructure to identify, authenticate and verify attributes about any legal or natural person, visa the government and private sector, online and in physical proximity, also offline. And the goal of the Commission is to have this in the hands of 80% of all Europeans by the end of this decade. And to achieve that, they've actually obliged the big tech platforms, the so-called very large online platforms, according to the DSA, to support this and offer it as a means to log into their service. And you can already see that, as this is a general purpose infrastructure, we have a variety of use cases. Um, of course, it is quite understandable that any e-government application needs to know the citizen or company they are interacting with. And many telecom providers are obliged by law to identify the customers. Um, and then we have um, certain uh, companies that we are obliged to also verify the age of their customers, like any tobacco store. But then we go beyond that with um, hotels that might want to use this for their check-ins or have the wrong keys as attributes in the wallet. Um, any type of e-commerce or um, health and uh, energy and water suppliers are specifically mentioned uh, to also use these systems. And lastly, also, we have what we would really consider the very bad use cases, um, credit scoring agencies like Kaiser 1870 in Austria or Schufa in Germany, um, media companies that might want to use this as a uh, portal for any login. And then, of course, the big tech platforms that are very data hungry and any access to government certified information 
about a potential advertisement target would be gold for them. Um, so I think that's a good segue to talk about risks. And going back to India, we had um, by late last year, 210 data leaks of ATAR information. And we're not talking the uh, average a few hundred thousand, but uh, three digit millions of data uh, leak affected people uh, in the Indian context. And uh, it was at times the whole database or subsections of it, municipal copies of the database and so forth. So there's a high level of IT security risk that comes with these systems. And mind you, as these are biometrical informations, you cannot, like with a password, you can reset it. You cannot reset your fingerprints. You cannot reset your iris scans. Um, there are also, of course, now a variety of uh, um, dubious companies that offer facial recognition based on these data sets. And um, the, the political debate that is one of the founders of this system, uh, Nandali Kani, and he says Atar is now part of Indian culture. It's yesterday's debate, and basically we have to move on. And uh, it's important to understand that many Indians are very proud of ATAR. It is something that they see as a very positive element of their culture that helps uh, people in their daily lives. And uh, that's why uh, there, there is certainly a critical debate from civil society in India, um, but uh, particularly when we look at the uh, global level and uh, international multilateral debate, um, ATAR is seen as something where India is leading the debate. Um, but it's not just India. We also have, and this is a great report from Privacy International, looking at many of the exclusions that we've seen um, in, in other countries. Um, we have, I mentioned already Uganda, in Kenya, we also had um, the plans originally to have a DNA linked national ID system that was stopped in the courts. Um, it was actually put on hold with an injunction. And uh, recently the court, uh, it's actually today, that the Kenyan High Court found that uh, this injunction is now lifted and uh, an adopted system in Kenya is now being rolled out. Um, it's also in, in uh, Spain, I think, a very important uh, data point to note uh, that a senior citizen uh, launched this very successful change.org petition with hundreds of thousands of signatures. And uh, he complained there that after the pandemic, it was basically impossible for senior citizens not being able to operate smartphones in their daily lives to obtain banking services and thereby being excluded from their pension, from their social security payments. And uh, that petition actually led to a change and a, a soft law, a code of conduct by the Spanish banking sector. And uh, will soon come about European debate. Senior citizens are a very important stakeholder group in any debate about digital public infrastructure, because not everybody is able to operate a modern smartphone safely or willing to do so. And those people still have a right to participate in society. To sum up the risks, we often use the word or the terminology of the risk of over-identification or oversharing of information. Right now we have many situations where we are able to do things anonymously or pseudonymously. Whenever you enter your name on a paper form, you have the right to also give different writing of your name or to don't, don't use that other uh, middle name that you rarely use. Um, you can uh, lie, of course, if it is not any official form. And very often you can also call yourself Mickey Mouse and you can just use anonymity in many of these instances. That, of course, is no longer possible if it is cryptographically signed, government-issued identity information. And if Google is then asking the question, suddenly it gets uncomfortable. Um, we have many people that have, for the right reasons, um, attributes about them or their family or their DNA tree that they would rather not have exposed whenever someone is asking for it. Uh, we have many situations where we are simply not in a position to refuse and not give our consent. For example, a border crossing, or if you really need to enter into that type of contract with a company. Um, so consent in itself is not sufficient for many of these use cases. And I'm happy to say that the EDAS regulation acknowledges that by going much further beyond the GDPR. And it's maybe a good point to talk about safeguards. So what's actually now on the table, what have the uh, wise European legislators uh, agreed to, and there's a lot of good that I would like to start with. The most important safeguard 
is a right to opt out of this system. Not only is the system free of charge and voluntary for any natural and legal person in the European Union, and mind you, it only uses the terminology of persons. This is not about citizens. This is not even using the residency terminology. So we have a quite inclusive framing in the law. Any person in the country has the right to obtain this wallet. But they are, have the right that they can also refuse. They have um, in a particular article, and that was adopted with a wide majority in the European Parliament, from left to right, all parties agreed that every natural and legal person should have the right to not use the system without suffering any negative consequences. I'm quite proud because that non-discrimination provision was a brainchild of ours and it made it into the final law. No matter if it is public services or goods, the private sector or the labor market, any person not using this new digital identity system cannot be hindered, restricted or discriminated in any way, which is an important stopgap measure. Um, secondly, you have seen the ATAR number before, the serial number for the people. Um, and in many Northern European countries, Scandinavian countries, we have similar systems. Uh, in Austria, it would be um, uh, contrary to our national legislation to use the social security number for everything. That's why we have the BPK, the um, area specific uh, person identifier since 2004, which is a huge uh, asset that Austria has. And we are not alone. The Netherlands and Germany have similar systems where, uh, because of our history, we don't hand out numbers to people. We have no universal persistent identifier for everyone. The EU proposal from the Commission foresaw something like that, and the lawmakers intentionally decided against it, um, which I think is a very important thing. And this is the last point of that. There is also jurisprudence in Germany from the 80s, the so-called Volkszählungsurteil, which also found such unique persistent identifiers to be unconstitutional in Germany. We also have a right to pseudonymity. In Article 5 of the EDAS regulation, you have a right to give a pseudonym wherever you are no, not, not under a legal obligation to be identified. So you couldn't give a pseudonym for A1, for any telecom provider in Austria, but you could use a pseudonym for Facebook, for example. Um, Another good thing is zero knowledge proofs. That might sound quite technical, but it's actually one of the great things that cryptography and math brings us. It's a way to prove that you are above 18 without really revealing your birthday. So you can prove any fact about you without revealing the underlying information. You could prove that you live in a city without giving your home address. That is a very important function that the wallet brings. And lastly, unlinkability. That means if you interact with the same or different relying parties without identifying yourself, they cannot correlate these interactions with each other. That sounds also technical, but it's something that's as in every ISO standard in this area, something important. And it's basically just codifying in law what technology already brings if it's done right. And the last point really is use case regulation. There is a particular dear thing, uh, dear, dear safeguard of mine, and it, it basically uh, uh, tries to acknowledge that the private sector has good and bad actors and that there are legitimate questions to ask someone and illegitimate questions. If you are doing a hotel check-in, you have no business in asking for people's health records or their family status. Um, and doing so even on individual cases would be unduly and needs to be notified. And that's exactly what the EU foresaw with the use case regulation Every use case needs to be registered and there's a technological limitation to only ask what the registration obtains and the list of all registrations is public. Um, these are good things. Now let's talk about the bad things. Well, how am I on time? Are you good? It's okay. extremely interesting. Go on. Good. So, one, one thing that I would really would have loved the EU to adopt, but sadly, it didn't was a ban on biometrics being a precondition for using the system. And we know this from Austria. When the ID Austria system was rolled out uh, uh, last year, we had a load of criticism uh, from the public saying that, why do I need to give my face ID or my fingerprint to use this public service? And many people actually decided not to use it because of that. Um, and we wanted to have a provision in the law that says um, you cannot force people to use biometrics. There need to be an option to also use a PIN or a password or any other means of 
uh, uh, authenticating yourself. Um, that would have been a great addition. Uh, the, tech, the European Parliament adopted a great text in its first reading mandate that even went beyond and said, if you do biometrics, you need explicit consent before uploading it into any cloud. Um, the difference being, if you use Face ID on your phone or your fingerprint sensor, the biometrical information stays on your phone in something called a secure enclave. That's a specific chip that is highly secure and Apple or Google never know your fingerprints. And this is a technology that um, most Western countries is, is like the only thing that we use for digital identity systems. But particularly in Asian countries, it goes the other way around. The biometrical pictures from passport databases are pro, um, provisioned onto the smartphone. And then, for example, in COVID times, we had this, uh, you are under quarantine and you you have to scan your phone and do a selfie that's then checked against the biometrical database of the country to see whether you are really at home. Um, something like that would have been prevented with the European provision, but sadly, uh, in trial council for part and the Spanish presidency, so it was not approved. Um, and then the most important point for me personally um, is unobservability. This goes beyond unthinkability, and that's really the bird's eye view about what we do in these systems. It's whether or not governments or issuing authorities are able to see user transactions. And if you think back that these systems are meant to be used on a daily basis from whenever you log into your bank account, you do public transport, you check into a hotel, you cross a border, you log into Facebook, you do your taxes, you do payments. It's basically everything about everyone. And it would have been right if the European Union would have agreed clearly that the architecture should prevent anyone from obtaining this bird's eye view about a population level data set. We did not manage to get it into the articles. We get it, we got it into the recitals. So actually the text is contradictory here and the technical implementation as often in the EU will decide what really counts. But that's an open debate that will be decided in the next months. Um, there are things that we consider not as good as they could have been. Um, the security of this whole thing solely rests on the idea that certifications can help and that um, certification schemes that will only be developed two years down the road will ensure that this thing is secure. Uh, for the intermediate period, uh, member states are left to their own devices to certify the security. And coming back to the ubiquitous nature of the system, a downtime of even a few hours, let alone a month, uh, would be devastating because this is the central key for everything. And so I think we, we cannot stress enough that uh, uh, such a single point of failure needs to be highly reliable for it not to cause problems. Um, and then lastly, um, open source is one of these things where we have text in the law that says at least it needs to be open source in the application components, but there are exceptions and it's also not free software. But we will see template open source implementations Open source here is particularly useful because it creates um, trust. Everybody can uh, uh, audit the code. Every expert can look into it. That is uh, like in science, the idea of peer review. Everybody is able to really check what it does. And it's one of the learnings from the pandemic with many DPI systems that if you do it open source, you have all the experts in society helping you with improving the system. So that is just a missed opportunity, but every member state is free to do an open source. And I, I uh, earlier today, I was in a meeting with the educational ministry in Austria. The new uh, open education system will be open source, which is a big novelty for Austria. Before that, it was Microsoft, but now they've seen the light and it's all going to be open source. Similarly, the, uh, the ID Austria in Austria also has certain components that are open source. So Many member states are getting there, but in the European legislation, it's not a clear obligation. Um, let's go at what's next. And I was coming to last chapter here. The European Union uh, uh, is scheduled to vote on Thursday in this chamber in the plenary. Um, we are at the end of a long road. This all started in June 2021 with the Commission launching its proposal. The Czech, uh, first the French, then the Czech, then the Swedish, and then the Spanish presidency worked on that. 
Um, and we already went through the committee vote and 99.9% the vote on Thursday will be a yes, and this will be adopted. And as you could have guessed by my presentation, I'm also happy with many things in the law. Um, and once that is done, the text is published in an official journal, we have roughly by August for uh, the technical implementation. Many things will only be clear by then. And then by 2026 at the latest, the um, obligation kicks in for any member state to offer this European digital identity wallet to a citizen. So you can expect a transition away from ID Austria to the new system in the next two years. And yeah, there is the EDIS expert work group that does the technical implementation. Lastly, um, just to give you a little bit more of European background, um, we have a European health data space that is very much interlocked with EDIS. And it's basically the replacement of uh, what is ELGA in Austria or the Elektronische Gesundheitsakte that's currently discussed in Germany. So these systems will be used also for every visit to the doctor. And it will be the place where you store your uh, prescriptions when you take them from the doctor to the pharmacy. Um, we have, of course, age verification, many laws like the child sexual abuse regulation and age verification most likely will be done with these systems. Um, and lastly, the digital euro, um, which is also a very important piece of legislation that sadly um, was proposed only half a year ago and would need much more time and scrutiny, but it's scheduled to be also adopted by April. Um, let's finally get to the UN level. I think maybe that's why you are all here. Um, so we have this DPI safeguards initiative from the UN Tech Envoy. I have the privilege of being nominated to be a co-chair of the governance working group and also in the steering committee. And this is a very ambitious project from the UNT for creating globally recognized safeguards for digital public infrastructure. We see that many countries are individually working on this. We see that many international organizations like the World Bank have this as a prime priority of theirs to proliferate these systems. Um, and the human rights dimension is key for making this a success, for also creating the acceptance in large parts of society for this being a good thing and not a bad thing. And um, that's why the timetable, as ambitious as it is, to see an adoption of a final release by the summit of the future by September of this year. Um, uh, yeah, it's an ambitious one, but it's so important that I think we all need to work together for making this happen. Um, there actually is today a press release scheduled from the uh, UN Tech Envoy, so hopefully there will also be something in the media about this whole thing, but the website is already live. Um, we also see our role here speaking for European civil society, and I had the mandate of the umbrella of ADRI to work on the EDAS regulation that will also try to achieve something like a Brussels effect, to really bring the good privacy ideas, inclusive ideas that we've developed in Europe to the table, to the UN, and showcase how fundamental rights can be protected in practice with these systems. And I hope that we, as, as Europeans, can work together to increase the safeguards for these systems and uh, ensure that all of the applications, also for the most marginalized parts of society, are safe and inclusive, and that they take note of the power dynamics that exists in, in our societies today. There is a range of meetings all around the world as part of this project, and so I um, suggest to also keep updating the website, and hopefully we can also have more discussions about this uh, not just in the UN framework, but also in Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Thomas, for, for, for the big overview of uh, the issues we are dealing with. And I think you, you made the point very clearly what is at stake here. Um, and we try to sort of insinuate um, this already in our title, uh, unpacking uh, DPI, a brave new world. Um, and it's fascinating how it dovetails also with the, the, the current international uh, uh, processes underway with the Global Digital Compact. So maybe shall I, before I shoot off with a couple of questions, look in the audience and give you the chance to interact directly uh, with Thomas. By the way, for our online colleagues, you can put your question in the chat or just raise your hand and we'll, we'll, we'll have you uh, on the floor. 
Uh, we still have a good 45 minutes to go. Well, yes, more than 45 minutes. So I'll have Ambassador Christoph Thun Hohenstein, our Director General for Foreign Cultural Policy. Thank you, Thomas. I was always great listening to you. Uh, you said that the Arnold system is the most um, advanced system in the world. And then you presented the European system and talked about the process effect. Is that new data, in fact, imagine now? Or what is the advanced? Uh, I didn't really get it because if India is so far advanced with its system, why would the world rather choose uh, the European system? You ask a very good question. I mean, uh, it is it is the first in terms of its adoption. I mean, India being the largest nation uh, by population in the world, um, they definitely have the most users and the most proliferation, and therefore also the biggest integration of other parts of society into the Altar system. Uh, as I mentioned, it starts in school. It includes uh, democratic elections. So this is really an all-encompassing system. Uh, and which which makes also this context, this quote, understandable why it's part of Indian culture by some stakeholders. Um, but I think it's important to also pause here and say uh, there are differences of approaches. And for example, in Europe, it would have been unimaginable to onboard uh, three quarters of the population before having a legal basis, which was the case in India. Uh, it, it would be impossible to do this without the umbrella of the GDPR, and that, as we've just seen, many of the safeguards go much further than this GDPR because the DPI, according to the European legislator, poses unique challenges. Um, but but you're right. I mean, there are very different approaches, and in many of the global majority countries, that's also why I showed the SDG that I did in 16.9. Um, this is the way to even give out. Uh, um, any form of certification of statehood, of citizenship, which is also a problem that we don't have in Europe. Um, and, and if uh, this becomes the sole means to prove your identity, yes, of course, then it becomes the precondition for any type of government service. Yeah. Um, but uh, importantly, DPI is meant to be interoperable. So we are talking about a global system that aims to allow for data transfers and uh, also unique um, attribution and, and uh, addressing of uh, any person in these systems. So therefore, I think it's important to also, you know, state the claim from European perspective, we have with the GDPR, these systems of adequacy decisions, like allowing countries to obtain personal information from European citizens. And in a similar way, we should also ensure that safeguards are upheld before entering into any interoperability agreement. I think Christoph made a really good point. It was on my mind too, this geopolitical uh, uh, quest. I, uh, India is, is extremely active, uh, has been extremely active before, but particularly under its G20 um, presidency to push forward with their system. How, f how, how much do you see the Indian government um, pushing for, for, for their system? Or are they only pushing? Because I, I've, I've been seeing a lot from uh, you know, in documents advo advocating for 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 DPI and the Indian model, uh, how, how 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 do you see that uh, materializing in the UN safeguards initiative? Is it is it is it that the sort of exactly as Christoph said, uh, are the Indians pushing for the New Delhi uh, effect, and would they rather push mm -hmm. away? I in a, in a way, it, as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of fraud attributed to Atar. And so I think, yes, they uh, they see this as something where they can shine and where they can really bring something to the table as well. Um, but the existence of the DPI Safeguards Initiative is already an indication that they acknowledge that it can be a copy paste from the Indian system, that there needs to be a, a real negotiation debate about what a universal DPI system could look like. I um, cannot tell you uh, how happy we will be with the outcome of the DPI Safeguards Initiative. We'll do our best to achieve a good outcome. But then, as is the job of ours as NGOs, we'll give a neutral assessment on where it's good and where it's bad. And um, I feel like that India is certainly leading here, also because um, 
uh, European and uh, um, US uh, collaboration that existed, it's, it's almost only on a technical level. Like in the, in the meeting that we had uh, last week, someone raised the question, have you looked at privacy safeguards? And, ah, it's a good idea. No, we haven't. Um, so this discussion is uh, quite hypothetical in other jurisdictions. Uh, at the same time, uh, with the payment sector, for example, uh, India has billions in these systems already in terms of transaction volume that happens every day. So uh, uh, there, there is economic might also behind that. And um, one last actor that also um, is, is noteworthy and quoted in every DPI debate is Estonia with the X-Road system. And my view, Estonia was one of our fiercest critics, critics in the EDIS system. So they were against like 90% of the text, but they were not in the majority in Europe. And so the, I'm also calling on the Brussels effect because for me, this is a value-driven discussion. It shouldn't just be economical might. It shouldn't just be whoever has this as a priority out of pride. But if we want to do something like that, there are huge risks. So let's talk about safeguards. I have an uh, MG query. You've got the floor. Yeah, hello. I don't speak about diplomacy, but about the technology. So, first of all, the good thing is that Europe provides a lot of jobs and it comes from cybersecurity, so we can need an early research system. But I have a question why you adopt, why Europe should adopt such a system? while it's actually attacking all the other systems like the big brothers that are watching their still privacy. Point one. Point two, how the right to be forgotten, Article 17 GDPR enters in the whole issue, how the right Article 18 to not process my personal information is included in this issue, and about the digital infrastructure. So since I come from cybersecurity, we have the digital infrastructure for issuing the keys, the first session. So do you mean that everything is centralized? Is it in one server or you speak about blockchain, so anonymization, pseudonymization, all this kind of stuff? Because I can give you all the bad things about this and I don't see the advantage why we need such a thing. So if you can really clarify this. Issues. Yeah. Um, so in Europe, making laws is very, it's, it's exactly the opposite from the US. It's, it's very hard to start up, but once they are on the tracks, they always go through. In, in the US, it's the other way around. And with this one, the Commission chose the timing very intentionally with June 2021. The pandemic was still on top of everybody's mind. Everyone wanted to do everything online suddenly. And so that's the moment they picked to have this basically ride on that way. Um, we also saw other DPIs being adopted, like the COVID certificates that we also worked on, those QR codes for vaccination, which is actually one of the best DPI systems, in my opinion. Um, and so the commission basically saw the opportunity for this and went for it. Uh, the original commission proposal was criticized by both council and parliament because it was not finished. It was quite rough. Uh, I remember the quote of one MEP, you basically want us to vote on the headlines and everything else is decided by implementing acts. So it was much more the timing than the actual substance. Uh, now that we have a finished law with much fewer implementing and delegated acts where the law actually helps us assess it, um, that the opportunity to really go against it, uh, we always pointed out the risks, but we didn't call for rejection because that would have been untenable in the political circumstances right now. And for example, Germany had this as the priority, um, at least before the election. And so it was quite difficult to see uh, how this could fail. Um, but yeah, I mean, that question always needs to be asked, uh, particularly as these systems proliferate in other areas of life beyond where it's legally mandated to use them. And for the cybersecurity question, so blockchain is not um, uh, in any way um, a precondition for building these systems, but we also have no exclusion against it. So it could be a five blockchain system like in Germany. Um, there is a legal basis for distributed ledgers in the same reform. 
Don't ask me why, don't ask me what for, but it's there. Um, and on the question on private keys, uh, the law is silent on it. Uh, I would have hoped if there was sex in the first reading that we actually wanted to have uh, the keys only being on the device and also keys being created by the user, but that was uh, removed from Trilog. Uh, there is privacy by design and security by design still as an obligation for the wallet creation, but we have yet to see what this means in practice. I have another uh, uh, request for the floor here in the floor, but I have also uh, Mr. Martin Fritz, he's the um, Secretary General of the Austrian UNESCO Commission. I'll give you the floor later, and then I have Ms. Christina Leitner. So please. And thank, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I would like to touch upon three points, Mr. Lonya, and thank you so much for this really uh, interesting uh, tour d'horizon, as we say here at the Foreign Ministry. So, um, regarding value driven and also the previous question, why would you suggest or do you think there's also a right to an analog life? Also, regarding uh, the issue of senior citizens, uh, this is point one. Uh, point two, the good, the bad, and the ugly for the UN safeguards. What are the red lines? What do you think is absolutely essential that should be there? And also uh, in respect to how negotiations are currently going at UN level, also with the Cybercrime Convention, I'm sure you, um, you are aware of this. And then uh, my first point, I was wondering if we identify, that's great that we identify ourselves and citizens and we have wallets. What about identifying uh, algorithms or very smart AIs, so to say, is there a need to identify if I look to self-driving cars and, for example, this is this sort of algorithm and this is this sort of, uh, yeah, maybe this is, maybe because I'm not an expert, maybe this is a negative question, but yeah. No, these are great questions. questions. Thank you. Um, so uh, the first question was the right to be offline, and I, I think that something like this is on the horizon simply because we do have significant parts of our society that are overwhelmed by these systems. Um, and and uh, whenever suddenly there is no option to opt out, we have people um, actually suffering. And uh, the great example is every nurse and doctor in uh, Lower Austria, they cannot get their loan settled, their, their, their monthly pay roll uh, uh, without ID Austria. Um, and they are, like, because of my situation as an NGO, we also get all of these complaints. And uh, mind you, they are increasing whenever a new sector pops up, suddenly you get these responses from them. And I think that at least for any public service, we need to provide alternatives. And uh, the non-discrimination provision in the EDAS tries to achieve exactly that. Um, but there, are, there needs to be a discussion on what other things do we need as a, a horizontal obligation in order to ensure inclusivity. Um, and I think that that is a debate that has just started, but I mean, we're entering into a lecture, so maybe it's a good point for it. Um, on the uh, last question about the identification of algorithms, that's a very good idea. Um, we do have, in the AI Act, we have at least discussions about the registry of high-risk algorithms. I mean, it's, not a lot of work because now there is a public service and police exception there. Um, it would have been great to allow for a democratic debate about particularly the high risk algorithms that are out there. Um, what we do have in the EDAS is a decent obligation that the reliant party, person or company who asks you needs to identify themselves even before they can ask the question. And you have a record of all of the transactions, also the ones you refuse. Uh, and also the ones where you can, for example, also use your right for deletion and right to be forgotten, your data subject rights according to the GDPR. And on the second question, it's, we had to kick off last week. We have the first calls this week. I cannot give you an honest assessment yet, but I will be um, working very intensely to get a good outcome and I will also be vocal about the process because I think just the mere fact that I've been nominated to that doesn't give me any special rights. I think uh, of course there are confidentiality things that are really internal discussions 
but there also needs to be an inclusion. And there are also uh, certain points where stakeholders can give input. And I think it would be vital to have input from the technical community, from member states, from affected groups, and, red, and green lines. So for example, if a UPI, if there is a universal persistent identifier, that is an absolute no-go. If biometrics are a precondition, it would be a no-go. Um, if we cannot get a proper privacy by design, like zero knowledge, like unlinkability, unobservability, I mean, you are not creating a DPI safeguards initiative that doesn't have the safeguards that make it safe, does more damage than good. So if the UN gives its stamp of approval to something like this, then those safeguards must deliver. And that means also learning from those experiences, like the, all of the safeguards that we've just shown you in Europe. Of course, we looked into the worldwide debate and the good MEPs did the same thing. And then we learn from that. That's exactly the job that the UN needs to do here as well. But what, if I may just follow up on that question on the right uh, to, to an analog life and the right to be forgotten. So far, as in as insofar as you can say that, you just mentioned that these discussions have just started, so you're not really sure where, where you're going. But is this an issue for the rest of, I mean, we in Europe tend to be really privacy, extremely privacy focused and if you like, human rights focused. Um, is Are these issues, like you just, just mentioned, also of concern to the colleagues you've been working and you've been seeing? So is yes. this going to be yeah. So um, there, there is a global uh, coalition of NGOs working on digital identity systems um, for the past three years already. And this group uh, also has its discussions and its principles and its safeguards. And these are clearly things that uh, are logical conclusions from the harms that we've seen all around the world. But that's um, in geoposition. That's that's not surprising. But you think these will also feed into the, because one has to say the the the, the, the DPI is not an intergovernmental process. It's a UN secretariat that process with multi-stakeholder participation, so NGOs, but also governments and technical community, private sector, and all the rest of it. So. It's not only NGOs that are part of it, it will feed into their ideas. You think it will also find the the support of of, of other actors that might not have so much concerns like you? Um, that will very much depend on their interests. I mean, if you solely come on the, to the DPI debate from the perspective of, I want to increase efficiency of government processes, I want to increase uh, the availability of high quality personal data about a population because I interact with them uh, also as a funder, for example, as a, um, uh, an, an entity that uh, funds certain activities in, in a country and would really like to have a better overview about the situation, better database, um, then those interests might not align with what we as civil society call for. But in my work, um, I am used to looking for unlikely allies wherever I can find them. The only constituency that our work is to be accountable to are the people. And I am sure that the citizens want to have privacy with these systems and that they would rather prefer being in control about their own data and having agency also to refuse these systems. And therefore, uh, we see the composition of these groups and compasses, as you said, multi-stakeholders. We have NGOs from all variety and sizes in it, at the same time the private sector and international organizations. Um, that, so let's see where that discussion leads us. I couldn't give the DPI Safeguards Initiative a blank slate yet, but I I think the promise is worth working on. All right. Well, I'll give the floor now to Mr. Fritz. He's from the Austrian National Commission. You've got the floor, sir. Yeah. Um, th thank you very much for this very insightful uh, talk and information. My question relates, which systems of governance, administration, control and management do you see around these infrastructures? Uh, do we expect uh, traditional ministries of interior like the passport issuing state only organizations? Can we expect something like 
privatized train companies running the, the train infrastructure, or do we see a mixture like an internet governance of, of private and NGO actors? So what is built legally and uh, governance wise around these uh, the examples that you that you give and, and which ones would you suggest or hope for? Thank you, it's a great question. Um, so we see a variety of models that are out there. There's no one solution. Um, in India, it was uh, an independent regulator, the uh, ATAR regulator that was created to lead the development and also the adoption of these systems. Um, then in um, several African countries, it was actually European vendors, for example, Thales from France that came there and basically built the system. So there was first the marketing and then the law. Uh, if there was a law, and all very often these systems also have the personal information then not in service and data centers in the country, but here in Europe. Um, we see many of these systems also being uh, rolled out, uh, including being financed by international organizations as part of development cooperation. UNDP. Yeah. Um, so there, there is a variety of public or private or public private uh, systems that are out there. Um, even in Europe, for example, we of course have here EDAS regulatory authorities. Mind you, they don't need to be independent regulators, which is sad. We would have liked it to be as independent as data protection authorities, but it could also be, for example, in Ireland, it's the energy ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, also in Europe, there could be private vendors actually building the system. Um, so it needs to be issued by a government, and the government, the member state in Europe, has to offer at least one wallet but there could be multiple, and those could also come from uh, private sectors. Um, and the important thing here is the certification. Um, there needs to be a certification for security, for functionality, certainly not for data protection. That was uh, um, meant to be mandatory. Now it is an optional certification. Um, certainly, you need oversight. You need a regulatory authority, and I would strongly argue that this needs to be a public body that is the, uh, the actor a citizen or a company can go to if something is wrong, that you can complain to if uh, there is abuse, if there's identity theft or fraud, uh, it does foresee all that. It has clear pathways uh, for obtaining remedies in case you see um, the actors abusing the system. And I would argue that this is vital because if you have a few prominent cases of bad actors of using the system to obtaining, let's say, DNA information, then the whole trust is gone. And it, it, the only option available to many people would be not to no longer use the system. So I think oversight is key, and that can only be effective and independent oversight if it comes from public administration, at best an independent agency with uh, the resources to do their job. Um, and I think beyond that, it is uh, very much dependent on um, the particular use cases. For example, if you apply the systems in health, then the health ministry will have a lot to say about it. Like any implementation, again, like what the um, educational ministry in Austria just told me just earlier today, is that there's a lot of interlocking them. For example, Tirol has a very different way of having pupils data. And the whole system needs to take account for that uh, exceptional case in Austria. Um, and so any two top-down design system will fail. And one question that I don't have the answer to is how do you actually ensure local knowledge and um, the, the, the wisdom of the crowds that will then have to use the system is included in the design process as well. Mm. Thank you very much. May I just ask a follow-up question? So because you said it could be in Europe now, uh, in, in terms of implementation, it, we it could actually end up having 27 different systems? No. Um, so Because every country will sort of... Build... Hopefully not. Yes. Um, so the whole purpose of the EAS reform is that you have interoperability between all of these wallets. So yes, there will be a Swedish, a Belgian, and an Austrian wallet, or there could be three Austrian wallets in theory. Yeah, you know, um, but they all should allow for interoperability and you should be able to have um, your 
Austrian citizenship in the Austrian wallet together with your Swedish uh, university diploma and um, use your Austrian driver license for a uh, French uh, car rental company, you know, um, that there, there is really, uh, it, it means to be an interoperable system. And just as a word of caution here, you know, we're talking already in Europe, this great idea of having complete interoperability pays a little bit because you, 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 you uh, how do you standardize things like gender? How do you standardize things like uh, the particularities of a driver license? or um, a car registration, which means something very different even within Europe. So DPI also has a little bit of, I would say, a Kubernetes dream that you can design all of these systems top down. I think you need a lot more participatory engagement for this work. Thank you very much. I have a Mrs. Leitner who raised her hand. Ms. Leitner, would you like to take the Yes, thank you so much. I'm just going to take it down. Thank you very much for this very interesting and insightful presentation. Much appreciated. Just a quick question in relation to the Brussels effect you mentioned. I was wondering what role would the Trade and Technology Council play here uh, with the US, but also the Indians? Will there be some impact on that? We see that there is one subgroup, for example, in the US uh, TTC, US EU TTC. Uh, working on mapping, you know, um, the identity initiatives. So that is one question. The second question relates to your comment re in relation to Estonia's position, you know, in the IDAS negotiations, which I'm very surprised to because they were the ones that were actually, actually bringing in all these uh, principles like once only, but also privacy by design into the European debate and, and legislation. And also were the first ones using their EID system uh, early on. So, so I'm quite surprised uh, that they were sort of reluctant here in the negotiations. So what was the background here? Because I also know that Estonia is very active in, in digital diplomacy. So if you could enlighten me on that, thank you so much. Um, so maybe first to the, to the second question. Uh, I was referring to nitty gritty details of the negotiations because we had with um, Anders Ansip, a very prominent MEP who was rapporteur in the IMCO committee in the EDAS negotiations and also in the LIBE and ITRE committee, a few Estonian MEPs. And I was just very often in these debates and there were, let's just say it took, it took more convincing, for example, that a universal persistent identifier is a bad thing because many of the Estonian colleagues actually saw no, we use this for many years and it works for us. It's a good thing. Why, why, why don't you want to have this? Or, for example, the question of unobservability, where uh, a lot of the arguments were then exchanged uh, much more on a geographical uh, divide than any political party divide, which is was a, was a very unique experience for me too. That it's not so much about the political direction, but much more um, the the home country of the MEP that uh, decided their position on the concrete uh, legal text. And I mean, ultimately, we came to a good conclusion that was also supported by uh, colleagues from Estonia. So I don't think that there is any persistent divide in that sense. Um, but uh, for example, the privacy by design, uh, as a principle, I think everybody in Europe can uh, agree to. But the job that was done with EIDAS was to basically make this more concrete and make a choice on the architecture, make a choice on things like unlikability and zero knowledge, um, and uh, to also assure people that certain safeguards are not simply an administrative procedure, but also a technical procedure that simply makes it impossible to obtain information, no matter what their, whether uh, um, an administrative procedure would receive someone to gaining access to it or not basically prevent the data to ever exist. That was one of the discussions that we had. And lastly, the non-discrimination provision is at odds, because uh, uh, if, if you have a mandatory system and then an obligation not to force people to use it, of course, those two are hard to square. And I think that was part also of the reason why um, those debates were necessary. But again, I believe that they were fruitful and led to a good outcome. Um, and on the uh, the mapping hypothesis, and uh, um, I think you also sent me that, which was a, a great resource, and I was also part of that um, conversation, I think it was uh, last week, 
And again, it was great to see this technical work being done and creating uh, a mapping of the different terminologies. We're talking about the EU US. Yes. TTC, the Trade and Technology Council, who's yeah. doing a mapping on, on uh, digital identity systems. Correct. That was, so uh, very important. I, I have a background in technology. I, I, I was working in tech for eight years. And I was, as a nerd, I can totally appreciate that. Um, I just feel like that we also need to uh, take the citizen and user perspective into account. And for example, what are the privacy guarantees that I can rely upon as you as a European citizen? In comparison with these two systems, and how how would then interoperability work, and what needs to happen for it to work? These are important questions, also in a transatlantic forum, that might be worth exploring, um, and and that is so completely separate from the GDPR equivalency and privacy shield debate, you know. Mm -hmm. So you you did watch uh, the event uh, 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 last week. Indeed, I sent you the link. I didn't see it. So <laughs> So how how do how do how do these discussions look like? Because we know very little about what is discussed among the Commission and U.S. colleagues in the EU U.S. TTC. Uh, it seems quite technical, as you say. They do taxonomy, te uh, terminology uh, comparisons, and try to sort of find some synergies or some way of conve converging the different terminologies, taxonomies. So what's your what's your how, how does it work? It was very nerdy and very like, okay, we have this definition. What does this mean? How does this relate to standards, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, standardization? You have to see that there is a global legal debate that's happening, and then there's also technological debate. Mm -hmm. There are individual solutions by companies, and there are also public value solutions that are developed, like Open Wallet Foundation from the Linux Foundation. And then there are uh, standardization bodies that are establishing for example, a way how you can put a driver license on your phone. Um, Apple is not deciding that unilaterally. These are actually uh, uh, agreed standards by uh, ISO. Um, and so all of these three are tried to be squared in one debate, but it was very technical. And I, 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 was, I would wish that we would also take the human rights perspective into account and also acknowledge power imbalances that, for example, if you use these systems, to identify your users. How do you prevent targeted advertisement? If you use the systems to do age verification, how do you ensure that the data of minors are protected? Because again, like if you do age verification with such a system and you do have a unique persistent identifier that is linkable in any way, I can follow that child for the rest of their life. It's as similar as if you gave away your fingerprints, you know, only that your fingerprints are not exchanged when you when you do something online and so these are the risks that should be key for the debate to um to really be helpful in the creation of these safeguards hmm. any more questions from the floor yes angie and christoph anyone online we have one question in the chat for the video yes okay and at some point, if if I can, just sorry, uh, if you could enlighten us a bit about the position of the US, where they are as uh, the government, where their interests. But mm -hmm. let's let's have Angie first. And no, it's okay. I don't think it's a question of standardization because I know the standardization body, but it's you and technically you can do everything. But I just think that this is the. I mean, if someone steals your UDI, imagine. It. What's going on there? I mean, he's linked, he or she is linked everywhere. This person has basically can totally deny their identity. The people can be non-existing only because someone stole their identity, number one. Number two, with have, when the law entered in 2021, or the EU started talking about it, it was before generative models. Now, with the generated model, ChatGPT, large language models, I can swap your face ID and I can swap your fingerprint. It's not identifiable anymore. It's not unique. And everything is basically, it's a, what we call generated content that you cannot distinguish from the real one. So we are working on deep fake uh, cybersecurity. 
So this system cannot be generated or this ID, digital ID, in non-digital way. And if every digital way it can be generated, then the system is totally generatable by artificial means. So I think before discussion legislation, it's better to get a tech, a tech committee to, that links the yeah. technology to the legislation, to the to the what's going on. And this is how I see the whole thing. And also the point of who is going to certify it. As I say, it's like a cybersecurity. Somewhere you need certification for the initiation of the key. So who is going to initiate these UIDs? So does any uh, country has a server? Because let's speak technically, it's a huge server that initiates the whole, or it's a unique server international. I mean, it's, it's horrible, it's a dystopia. It's really a brave new world that we are going to create here. Or I missed something. No, you don't. <laughs> Um, so, uh, that, that was also pointed out by other, our colleagues from the Consumer Protection World, like uh, the on in the law. Um, yeah, the, the, the risk of identity theft uh, is huge with this. And to give you another example, like in Austria, under Consumer Protection Law, when someone uh, says you have a contract with them, and you as a consumer say, no, you don't, the um, burden of proof is on the company. To prove that they have contract with you. With these systems that turn around, the company has to put a graphic signature that you've signed a contract with them. The fact that you were not in control of your phone is something that you have to be proved. Like suddenly it's on the consumer to say. And as I mentioned, like the the potential for cybersecurity nightmares here is huge. Yes. And the, the complete security rests on that the government that issues the wallet has another entity that certifies the security. Perfecto. Yeah, it's not the European Union or any umbrella that certifies the security. It's another branch of the member state that issues the wallet that certifies it. And when it comes to the, like, where are the servers, uh, I can only speak about the, for me, the best case scenario, the COVID certificates, like these QR codes that we did in the pandemic. Of course, you need a trust anchor. In that case, it was the commission that gave basically the root certificate and all vaccination centers all over Europe were signed by that. Um, I have no idea how this would work with the UN, but for interoperability, of course, you always need a trust anchor. And that gets even more complicated if you then only acknowledge certain countries, but not all. So don't, good question. There is no answer so far. Last point, sadly, it's a hard truth that I, as someone with a, taking your background, you have to work with all the time. We make laws where we don't know if the tech exists, but we make them anyway. The digital euro is another example. On Wednesday, I'm in another call with the ECB. They have just tendered out 1.2 billion about the creation of the technology for the digital euro. So we make the law before we even know what the technology will look like. You made one point that really, uh, I think you mentioned territories or something. How is the or states that are not acknowledged? How do you how how this is going to work in territories that are occupied or as you said not uh, not acknowledged um, unclear legal status? Oh, it's going to be such a it's going to be a party for lawyers and policymakers. <laughs> so please, uh, please, Ambassador to Monstein. Thank you. This is kleine Bruder. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Well, my second question was going into this direction of kind of rogue AI, you know, a couple of years from now, it's not excluded. Um, but I want to come back to the question of trust in public authority. Because basically, uh, we shouldn't be naive. I mean, we have 25% of countries in the world that are liberal democracies, and a lot of these countries have problems, both in that direction. Then we have illiberal democracies and we have authoritarian states. I mean, there is very little trust in public authority in the latter categories. So, what does it mean for a new, new end driven instrument? That is a, not an easy question. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the reality we have to live in. And the potential for using these systems and basically erasing a dissident or opposition leader from the public records and everything that connects to that, like the ability to do banking, to their taxes, to social media and everything. So yes, that's very scary. Yeah. And uh, in a way, without rule of law, all these things become very dystopian, very fast. What's the role of the UN in that? It's a very good question. Um, the one thing that I can say as a digital rights person here is that technology cannot fix that. This is not something that any system, no matter how it's designed, can remedy. And the only thing that that might be worth exploring here, but that would take a lot from the other 25% push for, is decentralization. To offer a multitude of truths about a person, to offer real control about your keys, about your identity. Um, that would be quite a libertarian idea. I'm not sure how that would fly politically, but that would be a way to, to, to remedy that situation and to um, still give, by giving acknowledgement to something like self-sovereign identity, suddenly whole new solutions for things like um, statelessness could come about. And there are examples for that. Uh, I In the first slide, I had this map and you saw many countries in the global south that are MOSIP as a system, which is an open source identity system. They have taken the experience from Uganda into account with people being excluded citizenship because of their Muslim speaking name. And so now a village could give uh, uh, attribution to someone. No, that guy lives here and his family lived here. He's one of us. And that's a level of recognition for their identity in the absence of central recognition of that person's identity. So there are ways if, if you're willing to really do a little thought exercise. Maybe before I give the floor to um, uh, Murat, uh, um, Murat uh, can, we, can we have the, ch the question in the chat, uh, Christina? Because I think the person, whoever put it in the chat, we know who put, oh, yes. put it um, in the chat. We have a question from Singapore. Oh, cool. Hello, I'm just going to pull it up from Peter Gushenbauer. He says, um, hello from Singapore. Uh, you rightly point out the high level of legal protection that we have in Europe. However, outside of Europe, the US and China and India have all the truly innovative digital economy companies and other emerging countries are keen to leapfrog the West by leveraging digital technologies. Our concern, concerns with um, privacy and data protection will ultimately lead to a situation where we're completely left behind by those with fewer inhibitions. It is already happening. Do you see any chance, chance that cautious Europe will be able to catch up with the te technological leaders? And then um, he adds on to that. Um, this debate is quite typical. We are practically only talking about risks and not at all about opportunities. Other parts of the world are creating multi-billion businesses while we Europeans are just running scared. What a pity. So I guess the question is, um, do you see any chance that cautious Europe will be able to catch up with the technological leaders and um, with the context of the other comments? I mean, it is not my role as civil society to praise uh, the potentials for the private sector with such systems. So I would rather have the opportunity to, to point at human rights risks and I work on making the systems safe, not uh, economical uh, viability of, of, of any model. Um, but I actually think that a lot of the dominance that we see in the tech sector is natural because you have network effects. Uh, if you are the biggest sum fund, then it's, it's much easier to leverage that uh, to also gain power in another sector. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if uh, the question should be um, how Europe can like if we have the chance to sacrifice privacy and other human rights in order to lead in any particular sector. I hope that uh, our politics would um, yeah not do that. 
bargain with the devil, basically. Um, and I think you also had a question. Well, and I have Murat before, and then we come to Leone. Okay. Uh, sorry, we have Murat before and then Leone. Please, Thanks. Murat. Uh, this getting is extremely interesting and also very uh, helped us better understand some of the things out there because there's so much happening in the tech with my name is Murad and I'm from the Human Rights Department and so uh, this, 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 this last discussion that we had uh, about uh, some of the uh, potential risks made me think once more in the same way that we very often in the field of human rights, uh, rights face. Yes, there are risks, but many of these risks are not inherent to the digital sphere. And I mean, both identity theft as well as uh, erasing identities have happened before. That, that's nothing new that we're facing now. So for me, it's not so much um, about, uh, about, about oh, there are scary new things that, that never existed before, but, uh, but how can we make sure that in the digital world they do not have more, they do, do, do not happen more than in the real world? And yes, some, some of these things will happen, but the problem, as you, as you pointed out, is not. Well, then we then we shouldn't go down this avenue, but we should get it right. We we we, we may have uh, potential dystopian scenarios uh, linked to digital identities in some in, in in some parts of the world, but we have these. Uh, we, we don't need digital identities to have these scenarios in, in in many countries already now. And so 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 for me, I I I, I think what 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 will be important will be to really get get it right. But it shouldn't keep us from going down the avenue. And I think that's where the role of the EU is extremely, extremely beneficial because we are a values-based community. So we, we do try to do, make it, but we also try to make it right. And, and I think that's, that, that, that's also what, what makes it more attractive, this Brussels effect, so to say, to, to other regions because we don't just go down an avenue that's easy. We, we have very cumbersome ways of doing it, but very often, what comes out in the end of this very cumbersome uh, procedure with the trilogues and, 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 and all, all, all engagement of civil society is actually a quite good one. It may not be the easiest one, it may not be the quickest one, but one, 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 once, what can, uh, once we have a system, it actually is something that, that, that can, it can serve as a very good model in a lot of other situations. And so I think that might be one of the big advantages that we have in this, so, so to say, geo, the geopolitical sphere of the, the, the UN debates that we can't, we don't just point at, look what we have, but we actually can point at something okay, very good that we have. And so that, that, that makes me somewhat optimistic, um, but then again, the UN is a very cumbersome uh, animal, so I would be quite interested also a little bit in your You've been involved in this now for for, for a while. Uh, looking at the uh, UN safeguards discussion, what's your personal expectation of the outcome, both content-wise but also time-wise? What, 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 what do, do, I, I assume that's going to take hard negotiations. Do you think it's realistic to come to anything by December of this year? I really love your approach, and I think that's also uh, what what I would completely subscribe to, like that. Europe, Europe can bring something to the table here that's extremely valuable and it, that we should not hide, but we should really actively propose as a solution. Everybody wants these systems to be trusted. Everybody wants these systems to be a success and a, a, a just basis for all parts of society. That's not tilted in any way. And stable and privacy friendly in the data economy that we live in. So if Europe can offer that, and I think with the EDAS under our belts now, we can, then it should be our, our priority to use the next months to advertise these ideas. And that's why I pulled for a Brussels effect that was also a little bit of a, a hope of a self fulfilling prophecy here, um, knowing that the UN is cumbersome. I mean, yeah, we worked on the Cybercrime Convention. There are good and bad processes at the UN. On this, I haven't seen anyone with bad intentions yet. We are at the beginning of it. Um, my assessment of the outcome so far is vague. I hope that we can really get something that will, of course, be at, as concrete as a legislation, but principle-based and something that, no matter where it's applied, it should increase security up to a level where you have a fighting chance to get it right for everyone in that country. That would be my personal goal for, 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 for which I'm going into this debate. 
And uh, yeah, December is the formal deadline. I think much more important will be around the summer when we have the first, second draft and the consultation around that. Then you'll see. And by September, which is just around the corner, we should have something for the summer of the future. Um, and also because you asked that before, I, I cannot give you anything about the US so far on what their position is, but I would love to know. Maybe it is new. Well, I think, you know, we have not yet fully discussed it. Just a comment on the Brussels effect. Right now, you know, in the UN, European Union, the West, if you like, has a quite a credibility um, um, a crisis and people just don't swallow the Brussels effect so well. They just don't want to be patronized again and again. So, you 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 know, we might have a hard position on that. Uh, secondly, time timeline, um, because you, you kept saying it has to it should be it should be feeding into the um, summit of the future process. The, the timeline that you've shown us, it will be extremely difficult that we can even, you know, integrate one sentence or just, you know, acknowledge or take note or whatever in, in the Global Digital Compact or in the chapter on the, the, the Pact of the Future, because the Global Digital Compact uh, negotiations, which are only intergovernmental, and the, the Safeguards Initiative is, is a different animal, um, they're starting in March and they will need to be finished by June, July. So even, you know, the high level advisory board on AI that has been created also by the UN Secretary General, who's due to give um, to, to publish their final report by June or July, will be too late <laughs> to feed into that process. So I think at best, what I think we can hope for that we can save it then for the for the visas plus 20 process where probably it makes much more sense to put it in there anyway and and just hope for you know general recognition of of dpi and and the importance of safeguards and and try to distill i don't know a couple of principles that we can put in there and it would be actually really helpful if you could help us that we can push for language we as in austria officially can push uh, also within the eu coordination that we push for the right language what was the last Close thing, mate. Um, we have papers coming up here on this issue. Like, there's one that really summarizes the whole debate for the UN audience, tries to abstract away the European nitty-gritty detail, and there is much more to come. Like on our website, which is bilingual, there's always the tech uh, EID, and there a lot of that can be found. And um, yeah, we, we are policy notes. So, so we it's sixteen thirty. We. Are slowly, slowly wrapping up, but of course I have not forgotten Leone. Do we have uh, any, any, just the, like a last call for our online audience? If you'd like to to raise your hand, it's the moment now because after this uh, last question, we're going to wrap up. Give Thomas maybe uh, an opportunity to speak famous last words, and then and then we're finished. So Leone, please, you've got. Thank the you. Um, my question was whether there was any time for an analog backup of any of these documents. So say I don't, I decide that I have this wallet as a user and I sign all these documents online. What if this identity theft happens? How do I have a way of proving that I, you know, registered somewhere, there's like a physical copy of something that I, I made, I did, right? Because that it's, it's kind of not like, oh, yes, there might be 20% of the population who don't want to use it, but then what about the other 80%? And like, once they get into that situation, I just think that yeah, is there any conversation around that? And then related to that is that in the past, when I signed a document there, it would also be based on interpersonal trust, right? I go to an office, I sit across from someone, I trust that they put in my data in the correct way. Now we talk about trusting a system. Now that is kind of this diversified trust, which I think might be an issue as well, because we tend to want to trust in specific entities, but here we talk about design, process data, and from what it sounds like, that would be spread all across different actors across society. So how do we kind of compensate for that? And how do we speak to people and users and make them trust? Great question. Um, that, that really touches on the use case regulation. And uh, on the UN level, we, it's far too early to answer that. And having paper-based alternatives would be great. I, I, I would certainly push for that, but it will be difficult to see that we can actually enshrine that into any of the safeguards. In the EDAS, we actually had text to that effect that was negotiated out in trilogue, but the parliament foresaw uh, not only that any 
evidence cannot be deemed be inadmissible when it's digital, we also had text in there that any analog evidence cannot be deemed inadmissible just for not being digital. But that latter part was struck out. Uh, so in case you have two conflicting copies, like two certificates, one digital, one analog, and they are not saying the same, uh, it will so far be up for the courts to decide which one they would believe. There is nothing in the in the law, uh, but you cannot refuse the admissibility for anything digital. So that makes any document you sign, any attribute that is handed over, very hard to refute. Um, and yeah, ultimately, it will you will you have to oversight. For example, if a reliant party asks you for something, you no longer have the physical contact when signing a contract. But on your phone, you would see the ID identity of the other side, their contact information, their country of registration, and also the possibility to complain against them. And they could be excluded from the whole system if there are significant complaints about them. Mind you, if it's, for example, Facebook Island or any company based in Ireland, I have very little hope that this would happen. But in Austria, I'm very hopeful that any, uh, um, any company that uh, doesn't uphold data protection would be kicked out of the system. And so uh, these are harmonized systems. That's important to note. Um, when we see any horizontal uh, issue-based problems of fraud or anything, that would seriously undermine the trust in the whole system. But then, I hope actually that this is an unlikely scenario given the certifications. Well, so time to wrap up. Famous last words. Um, you want to sum up what's your? I am very happy that we could have features? this discussion and for the invitation in general. Uh, a lot will happen this year in this whole process. I would love to keep this conversation going. And we have a lot of European and UN files that we hope to work together with all of you. Um, so let's just keep the conversation going. And thank you very much for the attention. Indeed. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for everyone to come here and also to our online guests from Singapore to Sweden. And I think I've even seen Estonia, um, Peter Mikkel, I think, if I'm not wrong. So thanks a million. And we still have some coffee, juices and water. Please stay on and network and mingle. Let's keep on discussing. We are very thankful for, for, your, for your participation here, for your coming. And we will certainly continue the discussion. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.